further. So thank you so much for coming and uh, let's hear it about threat intelligence. And um, so the first thing that we, we did in order to, you know, sort of, you know, go with the flow of the weather, we changed our logo. So, um, no, kidding. Um, so we apologize, we're kind of locals um, for the weather. And before we even get started talking about this, I would like to point out that we also have a KCD, a Kubernetes Community Days in, in Vienna. So just in case you want to get a second chance, um, we are raffling out two tickets today, two free tickets to KCD Austria in October. So amongst those of you who are going to ask a question afterwards. So if that's interesting to you, come, come here to the uh, podium afterwards. The topic of today is threat intelligence, and it's a lot connected to actually to trees. The, the crucial part of what we're trying to do here is to make it visual of what attacks are actually happening in clusters. So first of all, we're going to start with Kubernetes. When we talk about cloud native threat intelligence, we want to make it observable what the threats really are so that you as a Kubernetes or cloud native user can actually see those steps along an attack path and understand what threats are actually relevant for you. Now, I'm really grateful to the organizers to again, for a second time, allow us also to bring some younger people along to present their research. So um, two students from the TOV are going to show some of the demos of their research that they've been doing in this open source project. Um, since we've become rather serious and the feedback on the project so far has been quite good, I want to start out with the original motivation of where this comes from, because threat intelligence is a very, very big topic and it's very often actually more, more associated with malware. And so let's focus on where, where we actually started from when in, in KubeCon Paris we, we basically conceptualized the project. And the idea is this, so if you're a defender and you're running maybe a, a pass service, such as I've been doing for a while. And then you have a cluster running and for some demo, you install something like Neuvector, which is a runtime security um, exposure tool, essentially. And you expect for this demo, maybe you'll find 50 or 100 vulnerabilities just so you can show it to someone. And then what actually happens here, you find that it has 2,219 vulnerabilities going and you weren't even really aware that, um, that you had that much running there. Now, the point, and maybe you've observed this in yourself as well, is that when I see these lists, and this is just vulnerabilities, there's also misconfigurations and stuff in the network, etc. And I see these endlessly long lists of vulnerabilities and other types of alerts. It's, it's this instant fatigue that I get. It's like, oh my God, now I need to fix it. And not only do I have to fix this, but also there's always going to be this uncertainty in the end, like, did I actually remediate it? Did I introduce other problems? And, and this is the part that has been kind of driving me nuts and to the point that, that we asked ourselves, so what, what platform would we need to have to attack ourselves and see what's actually relevant? Which of these attack paths that are supposedly there in these alerts? Which of those are actually exploitable? One. And then, is there a way without too much risk to expose this to the world or to, yeah, to the wild to measure the ones that are actually currently being attacked by the humans? Because as long as we have human attackers, not so much the AIs, there'll be trends, right? There's this particular CV that we're going after because there was a POC just published. And so these are the two parts of, of the motivation behind it. So it's, it's mostly um, my exposure of, of that I have in my, in my clusters, in my cloud. And the other part is like, what of my exposure is actually currently interesting to the people that are attacking institutions such as myself? Now, if we want to build a, a framework that is going to hold in the open source world and it's going to be relatively generic, we need to have a couple of, of requirements. And the first one is that I want to be able to attack myself if I have a suspicion. If we're the, defender, the defending team, we often have ideas of what's probably not so great. So how can I validate this and make this visible? So that's the second part. We need a standardized way of, of visualizing this. And this is where these trees come in. So having what we call an ontology. And then the third part is, of course, a measurement process of checking and iterating and becoming better as we iterate, as we continuously improve this 
this process of defending, given the information that we've measured. So the vision from my point of view is to fight this fatigue of the endless lists of CVEs and endless lists of vulnerabilities where we never know where to start and whether we actually really fixed it. Because fear and uncertainty are not, not good for people. We should only feel them when there is a real threat out there. And this is the real danger, I think, in alert fatigue, is that we won't see the real threat because we're so tired of fixing all the stuff that wasn't actually relevant. This brings us to, to the process. So first of all, we all hopefully use full automation, IEC tools such as Terraform, etc., etc. And so we don't want to do this on a production cluster. We want to clone it. Like you couldn't clone your cluster or your entire tenant or set of tenants even. But please take all the data out, like the sensitive data, but leave it as close to production as you can possibly do. Then we need to produce the observability. That means we need to instrument it with tripwires so we get logs out of the system. This is mostly done using eBPF via Tetragon. Um, plus some other tools to, or a traditional application logging simply to get those logs visible. And then we want to take these clusters and have a method of attacking ourselves. So meaning constructing scripts, etc., that we can say this was our suspicion, our model will attack it and we, what we call calibration, we check that what we thought is going to come out actually happens. So once you've done that, if you want to, and if that's what you, what you are after and is what, what your risk appetite is, you can actually use this entire setup change. Typically, it's just a network change where you open up this infrastructure to the, to the wild and then you compare what you measured in your calibration because you checked, okay, I can see myself attacking myself, but what about the real guys? Is that actually what they do? And in the end, we, we'll see a lot of the visualization in a second you can compare this in a human-friendly way by not reading endless log files, but by actually looking at things so that you don't have as much cognitive load on yourself as you interpret this data. So the way the measurement happens, so again, we start with a tree. If you look at the right, no, left, left upper corner, now that's an attack tree, a modeled attack tree. You read them from the bottom to the top. In the, in the beginning, you have the initial axis. That's a real, typically, application vulnerability type. And then you have a normal chill chain, uh, uh, kill chain, sorry, uh, or escalation, such as um, privilege escalation, persistence C2, et cetera, until you exfiltrate sensitive data in the end. In the bottom, you have these honey clusters. So they basically give you all these logs relatively messy in the beginning. So that means that whole um, disparate log formats, etc., need to be translated into a standard. Here we take a relatively ancient standard called STIX. It's relatively well known from the malware analysis part. And now the question is, of course, how to glue those together, right? Once you've got the observables, now you want to link them to the model, and that's the indicators. And that pattern matching is sort of a mix between SQL and regex that um, identifies what part of the actual observed sticks observable is related to what indicator that you can load, for example, into a GraphDB or some other visualizer, and then you have your tree, and that's what we wanted. So that's what a normal log looks like, in this case a K-probe, and as you see, this was probably um, just a couple of hours of experimentation. You've got 200 megabytes of this, um, as a human, you certainly do not want to read that. This is why it's important to, to visualize it. And as it's important to visualize, what do these abstracted words mean, like sticks observable? So on the left side, you've got the, the JSON input. This is the actual observable. This is a K-probe example. And then you get it, you give it the structure by using the sticks format. The same happens with these indicators. So you have for example, access to Kubernetes service tokens. And then you write this sort of um, SQL logic or regex logic to say, to glue the observable to the model. So what you see here is a modeled um, tree, a modeled attack tree. In fact, this model attack tree, one, one um, node of it. And what you now see here is a full calibration of this full tree. So this is something that, that Joseph had done in his research um, where he executed an application vulnerability in RCE and then this entire chain 
to, to this calibration to say, okay, we can actually see it if it happens somewhere around some variations of what we modeled, we can make it visual and we can have it recognized in, in such a database, in such a visualization graph database. Now, this is the same model as here. We've got those honey clusters. And now, of course, is the question, what happens if I open this to the wild? This particular example was the leaky vessel run C vulnerability that was mediated in the end of January. You might have heard of it, about it. It was critical. So we opened this up to the wild and checked, like, what do we actually see? Well, nobody actually exploited the run C. So uh, we just saw a lot of C2 attempts, relatively crude ones. Um, yeah, but in the window that we had open, nobody actually attempted this. Now, this, of course, doesn't tell you that um, this is not an interesting vulnerability. It just means that we were either not targeted, so we're not the right type of people that were attacked in that window by those people. That's, that's neither here nor there, but that's what we can conclude in that particular experiment, which is not that surprising since we're a university, so people can guess that most of the stuff that we do is demo uh, in, in that particular IP range. Now, what we, sh we just showed is like a long tree, a complicated tree, a very high profile CV. We can make it visual, we can attack ourselves, we can calibrate it, etc., etc., etc. But if we wanted you all to say like, hey, install honey clusters and, and all of you give us this abstracted sticks models of all the stuff you see and give it to us, right? Uh, we have to basically have a means to say, well, what if my honey cluster environment was corrupted? And um, we need a way to detect that as well. And some of the most dangerous cloud attacks actually are um, pivots where you steal tokens to go from the Kubernetes environment down into the cloud provider. So those are really nasty ones. And this is what we're going to show you now. And they're really hard to detect as well, because typically you have one shot uh, where a token is stolen and then you're going to a different level of the cloud. So um, in this case, we're using managed identity because managed identity tokens are extremely powerful. Also, there are lots of defaults in Terraform modules that are officially supported by cloud providers that give you defaults where these tokens are way too powerful. I'm going to give you a demo in a second. So, um, and by the way, this is one of my favorite topics. So if you have any questions about this kind of federated identity stuff, uh, shoot me a question anytime, CNCF Slack. Point being, your application here in purple has the ability to assume a role via indirections here in the middle, in this case, um, Google um, examples, such that it has the power to, for example, access KMS, access Spanner, or access an SQLDB, whichever you like. So these tokens are different depending on the different services that you access, etc. Um, and that means we're going to demo one where you get an auth bearer token and you'll directly access the SQL user. And the important thing to remember is if I steal a valid token as the attacker, there, this entire indirection is skipped, right? There is no more further logins, nothing. So you can just directly grab this SQL thing. And the question is, of course, can we see it? And does that what we see inform our mitigation strategy? Those are the two important questions. So, and just in case that nobody misunderstands me, manage identities a lot better than passwords, but those tokens still have an hour. And if you steal them within that hour, well, let's see. Let's see, live demo. <laughs> Let the gods be with me. So, I need to first off um, get myself a token. So, these scripts are all um, on our Git repo. You can use them. We have AKS and GKE for you ready to um, basically reproduce at home. And I'm just going to, yep. So this is a simple one. Tobias, in a second, going to show you um, how this SSRF works in detail. I'm going to just simply steal this token now, assuming that somebody somehow leaked it in an endpoint. And, okay. All right. Let's see if that works. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is on the right side, I downloaded a developer, script, a developer tooling called, in this case, the Cloud SQL Connector Proxy from Google Upstream. Simply download it, make it executable, and then that's it. 
So what I'm doing here is from my laptop, I'm going to connect to this database with my stolen token, which I just tried to copy it. And so, okay, and I miscopied that in. Wonderful. Mm. I just, no, it actually did work. Sorry. There's just some, some. So authorizing with auth to talk. And that means my proxy connection from my laptop to that SQL database via this normal developer tooling from Google is working. So I have the proxy open. This is something that is very, very hard to detect. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pipe this token into the PSQL command. So meaning I'm going to connect to Postgres. That Postgres that was uh, on that um, diagram earlier and there was no login mechanism. I just piped that token in. And now I can list, for example, what databases I have there and why don't I select everything I have on my, uh, what's it called, table? Customer. Yay. And detecting this is it now going to be extremely difficult to prove unless you had any other means of auditing switched on. And this is where I hand over to Tobias to show you how this can happen in IRL. Thank you so much, Constance. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here today in front of you guys. Um, so Constance has just shown you how powerful these tokens are once anyone gets access to them. And now I want to show you a little bit more realistic example of how any application could become vulnerable to a vulnerability which exposes a token like that. And for that, we need the... Nope. <laughs> Do you want me to? No, I think not. I'll just refresh this. <laughs> for that, we need to copy the URL pointing to the locally available metadata API in the Kubernetes cluster, which provides us with the token. And um, I've prepared this example application here, which looks similar to the user management you see in many applications you probably use every day. And if we go ahead and log in with our user, it's the username foo, password bar. That's the password I use for all my accounts, so please don't tell anyone. Um, and we're presented with our profile. And here you can see some information about the user and a profile picture. And if we click on this picture, we're presented with two options. We can either provide an image locally or we can provide a URL pointing to an image. And the security experts among you might already know where this is going. If we try, try and copy the uh, URL where we can access the token from within the cluster, uh, as a URL pointing to a supposed image and press on upload, we can see that the profile picture has now changed. And if we go into the developer tools and the console, what we can do is we can take a look at the source of the image. And here you can see the sources of the image is set to some base64 encoded data. And if we go ahead and decode this data, we now can see our token. So let's take, let's take a step back and look at what just happened here. So when we clicked on upload, a request was sent to our service running inside of the cluster. And it contained a, a URL pointing to the only locally available metadata API. And because the block lists of the URLs were not configured correctly, uh, the service did not uh, notice that this is a problematic URL to request data from and thought it is just pointing towards an image, requested the data, encoded it using Base64, and returned it as the new profile picture of our user. Now, as we've seen before, what Constance has shown you, this is obviously bad, right? Now, someone has the token, has access to the cluster, and we can't really see what the person is doing. And it's comparable to your key to your house being stolen. You really want to uh, notice when your key is being stolen because you don't want to wait for an intruder to take away all your stuff, and you want to change the lock before that happens. That's why it's so crucial to detect these attacks 
and detect the token being stolen. But now you might ask yourself, can we even detect these kinds of attacks? And the answer is, unfortunately, no, at least not with high accuracy. Because what we need for an attack is, first of all, a valid uh, request to, to get some token. And this looks exactly the same when an attacker initiates it as to our application, which needs access to the user database, for example. So our application also has to rec request these tokens. So in order to um, see that an attack has been happening, we have to first have a request coming in, which is malicious from some attacker. And we can't directly link these requests with each other. Therefore, we have to link them or correlate them temporally with the logs we get from the, the audit um, logs from the cloud provider and with the logs we have from our application. So what does the detection of this attack specifically look like? Uh, Constance has earlier mentioned these indicators which contain some patterns. And here you can see an example of a pattern which can detect the attack you just saw. And the important part here is that we have to have all these artifacts happening within a given time frame. And if you look at this graph over here, you can see what this attack looks like visualized, what we see in the cluster. And what you can see if you look at the timestamps is that they all happened within milliseconds of each other. So if they happen within some time from each other, we can be pretty sure that there has been something fishy going on at least. So this was one example, right? In GKE, in our cloud, with our application. But can we detect these types of token thefts in general? And this is really, really hard because, as I mentioned before, you have to have access to the token and some malicious input or malicious action from the attacker. And these two things look completely different depending on your environment. So, for, for example, uh, accessing this token in GKE, as we saw, by default is a, a HTTP request to the metadata API. And uh, in AWS, by default, for example, you access the token via a file. But you could also configure GKE to provide the token via file. And there are many ways to access the tokens, and they all depend on the cloud provider, the version of the API you use, and the token flows you use. So it really is specific to your environment. And also the attacker input could look completely different depending on the applications you have deployed and what they could potentially become vulnerable to. So the point I'm trying to get across here is that you need to test it in your environment in order to find out what such an attack could look like in your environment and which uh, vulnerabilities or types of attacks you are really vulnerable to in order to know what you have to look for in your specific scenario. And no provider can promise you a one-size-fits-all solution to that. So, to summarize, Constance has earlier shown you these beautiful uh, long attack trees which happen inside of the cluster where you see every step, you can model every step, and in which you see on the left side and on the right side you see uh, the observed um, steps the attacker took. And down there, you see these compound attacks where you only have one shot at detecting the theft of a token, for example. And we've shown you that you can detect these with the Cloud Kubernetes Storm Center in your environment if you, um, if you test it out and find out what these attacks look like for you. So during calibration, you find out what you are exploitable or in which ways you are exploitable and what these exploits look like in your environment. And after that, once you know what to look for, you can open up your cluster to the public and find out what kind of attacks attackers really use in your environment in the wild and which attack scripts, for example, they, they use to get your information. So this is obviously all a lot of work, right? You have to set up your cluster, then you have to attack yourself and sift through these massive amounts of logs in order to find out what an attack really looks like for your special case. Now, is there some way we can make this a little bit easier on them, Lucas? So, thank you, Tobias. And first of all, it's a really a great pleasure being here. And exactly for that reason, you have seen, um, we have to create those indicators manually. And probably most of you aren't already Styx experts and don't want to go through gigabits of data, right? 
and for this reason we've introduced some kind of uh, some ai into this process in order to speed things up for us because most of the attacks we are seeing are relatively easy to to detect um, and for that reason we uh, have two main use cases where we use the ai the first one is classification of log or of logs in whether they are potentially malicious or not so we let the we first ask the ai hey this is a bunch of logs do you maybe see something suspicious in there and if so please describe the attack in, in, in some short sentences and also provide us um, the observables you detected as potentially malicious then we go through those logs manually analyze the attack try to understand okay what is really happening is this really an attack and if we are certain this is an attack and we say okay now we want to catch it in the future automatically then we create the indicators those are our tripwires which then automatically trigger when the attack is happening and this is the second um, use case where we use the ai where we ask it to help us create an indicator to automatically match this small selection of logs that we want to catch if we look down in the graph this is pretty much the whole process of the of our storm center how it works it usually starts with an attacker this could be myself but also this could be some attacker in the wild who attacks our honey cluster when the attacker attacks the honey cluster um, it usually leaves some traces those can be ebpf logs app logs network logs all kind of logs which we then collect uh, in our cluster and with the help of the ai um, we can then analyze those logs. The AI helps us just to not go through gigabytes of data, but rather through some, only some of those logs. When we are then happy with our indicators we've created, we then set up our tripwires to then automatically at, uh, um, catch such an attack in the future. Let's look a bit more in detail at the first use case. This is the classification task. Um, we provide the AI with the logs we've collected, and ask it to describe an attack if it sees some and also provide those logs that are part of this attack. Um, depending on the hardness of the attack, for example, we did one container escape, it was pretty easy to detect. But if you have more complicated attacks like the one we just have seen before, um, you usually have to um, iterate through this process two or three times uh, where you first see just some benign signal and then you tell it, okay, um, this is benign, um, please retry it again, maybe you find something else. And usually then you have um, end up with a way better result. And when you have this result, then you go through these logs manually. You really um, try to understand what's happening. And when you have understood what's happening, then you usually already not only have learned something about your environment, which threats you have for your environment, but also um, then you are fit for the next step, which is the creation of the indicators where we say okay now we have those five to whatever um, uh, mal malicious logs and we now want to catch this in the future so we once again ask the AI because we are not already complete sticks pros um, this can take quite some time to create those indicators so we ask the AI hey could you please create some indicators uh, that catch this attack um, usually we then tweak those um, indicators a bit more. For example, you see the pattern up there. Um, we usually have to tweak it a bit more uh, depending on our environment. And then once we are happy, we add it again um, to our honey cluster. We pretty much set the, up the alarm system for this specific attack so that we can um, catch it in the future. So bringing it all together. What the storm center provides is a way to proactively attack yourself or be attacked by some attacker in the wild, which then produces some logs. We can analyze those logs, understand in more depth how our environment works, what such an attack, uh, attack would trigger, how this all looks like. And this task can become quite tedious. And for this reason, we are introducing the AI to help us speed up the process which helps us uh, accelerate the rate at which we can gain insights in our environment and which, um, threat, uh, um, which threats are real for our environment.
Amazing. And it's this AI augmentation, because maybe you, you did find it rather tedious to all this, this JSON mapping and JSON mapping, and then I have to do the details. Um, and the reason for, for us, the, the importance of the open source part is that you can do this at home, right? You're not giving out any information to any vendor at this point, and you can specifically train it on your setup. However, um, it would never have scaled if, we, if anyone here would have to do this manually, you'd go nuts. Even if we were to crowdsource source this, so basically having thousands of people giving us the, the input would still not have been enough. But now with the newest uh, models, especially the, the neural graph APIs that are just coming out, they are very, very promising in both automating the attack tree generation, which is also something that modeling by hand takes a lot of time and a lot of knowledge work. Um, and that would have been prohibitive or is why cybersecurity is so prohibitively bad to scale. And now the idea is to generate both the trees, so the attack trees, as well as analyze the logs and iteratively improve it. That's, that's the idea and keeping it open source, hopefully as much as we can. So what are we looking for? Um, people that test our environment, give us feedback on all sorts of levels and layers and user usability. We are currently rewriting the stack from a early version to a much more productionized version that's hopefully gonna be there by the end of the year. And this would not be possible without the support of many, many people, both those that give us money, which is mostly the European uh, Horizon um, Network uh, program and as well as Giant. And these many people, especially mentioning Control Plane AI that have supported us uh, getting this started and building it up. And at this point, I would like to know if you have any questions. Yay. Well, actually, so even if you do practice defense and depth and do all this input sanitation, la, 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 you still have the cloud providers changing their implementations on a weekly basis, so to say. And the, what might be exploitable today might not be tomorrow or the other way around. So having a way to um, proactively test yourself, especially in an automated way, I think has a lot of value. And the setup here, what is, what is the hard part and a lot of work is those, those trees. But the idea here is to crowdsource them, right? and to auto detect. So most of the standard MITRE attacks will be detected by the LLM and you have to uh, may maybe correct this SQL-like syntax a bit. So, um, I mean, judge for yourself how long the setup um, takes you. Um, so I wouldn't, I mean, I'm, I don't wanna speak about the effort, but finding out whether you are actually exposed after you followed all the best practices, some of which never apply to you and some of which you cannot realize and some of which are too expensive and take a long time. Um, yeah, it really dep yeah. depends, I would say. Any other questions? Yeah. So, so we started out with this wonderful slide of my 2,219 or whatnot vulnerabilities, right? I can go for the top one by, by criticality and start um, doing that one. It should be said that in, as long as we stay on Kubernetes, there are only that many. So once you're through, once you're in the cluster, there are only that many things you can do on a Kubernetes cluster to, to escalate. And they're very standardized and well-known paths. So it's really only the first one that you need to really uh, check for. Um, Sorry, what was the second part of the question? Well, that is, so we have anomaly detection. So, so we also do have baselining here. So simply you observe your cluster for a while. This is what it normally does. And then you only from the anomaly, actually, you take the logs. 
Um, so from the anomaly there, you can either do it by eyeballing. So there are, like for example, the C2s we saw in the leaky vessel thing when we um, exposed it. Literally, I can see it by eye that this was an attempted C2 because they look so obvious, um, even without LLMs at the time. So what can you see it? Well, those are just going to be the, yeah, the anomalous logs that you don't normally anyway have in your applications communication. Cool. Well, thank you so much. All right. Well, and the other thing is that you don't want to make AIs, let, let AIs make decisions for you. I would always review what the AI spits out to me here. Because most of the time it is 90 something percent correct and, and then it's a little bit of nonsense. Um, so, yeah. Right, but in this case it wouldn't work because if that token is typically valid 3,600 seconds, right? So that's the standard. So you couldn't be hiding out. Um, well, well, this is because for each attack type you have separate patterns and separate matches, right? So, so in this case, you need to have the the pattern, uh, the token still be. Uh, so maybe I'm not understanding the question. Well, that's that's the big question. For for this specific attack, you really only have the um, malicious input. That's your only indication. Um, and then, yeah. And then typically, you, if you did defense in depth then you have the attempted uh, exfiltration or attempted reconnaissance. Somebody scanned your environment, somebody tried to find out what kind of databases, what kind of KMS, what kind of key vaults you have, and correlate that. Which, but that would be outside of where the token was stolen from. So, so this is the thing, like, there logically is no, uh, silver bo no smoking gun evidence for that particular thing. Yeah. Yes, so that's the baseline versus anomaly detection. That, however, still leaves you with a lot of logs that you need to sort through. Um, and putting them into graphics and relating them to attack trees, this is where um, knowing something about the goodness or classifying it according to MITRE um, just helps the eye a lot. So, yeah, But yeah, you can theoretically just take those anomalous logs and, and read them. It's, it's just very inefficient from a time perspective. It wouldn't help. It, so in this particular case, it wouldn't help. Because what you're doing is your application talks to the metadata API. That is a completely regular call. Um, and, and check out the containers we've implemented it for, for AKS and GKE, and then you'll see that there's literally no way for you um, seeing that there's, it's the container making the, the pod, making the call to the API. And it doesn't, there is no difference. There is just no difference. You can instrument the heck out of it, and you're not seeing a difference. Unfortunately, logically, it's not. Um, we have the application logs. We could put open telemetry on top of that, but uh, this particular case wouldn't help. Very good question, though. Cool, cool. Well, thank you so much. I think we, yeah, we are one more minute. So if you ha want, if you did ask a question and you want a chance to win the, um, the ticket, come see me here at the podium. Otherwise, thank you so much and enjoy the summit.